Hey everyone, this video is going to go over the PowerPoint on avoiding plagiarism, how to build credibility. So we've talked about the basics of APA format, how to design a paper correctly in APA format, how to handle your sources in terms of the reference list, and how to cite them in your parenthetical citations correctly. Um, but the truth is, you might be required to write a paper in APA format that you don't actually do research for. <laughs> it might just be a regular essay, and you're not really doing any research, you're not using any sources, but you still have to format it in APA format. So that's why we covered the basics of APA format first. And now we're sort of bridging over to actual research. And the first thing that I want to talk about is avoiding plagiarism. I've already mentioned several times in previous lessons that anytime you use information from a source that you have to give credit to that source. We're going to talk about that in more depth right now, okay? Why do you want to use sources? I mean, besides the assignment saying you have to. <laughs> um, using sources helps support your own ideas, your own argument, your own claim. And that's something that I really want you to think about. Using sources helps support your own ideas and arguments. One of the best ways to build your own credibility is to make sure that you are writing the paper yourself. Take ownership of your own thinking, your own ideas, your own thought process your own writing, your own research. You want the majority of your paper to be your thoughts. The sources are just there to help you support those ideas so that you can basically say to your reader, these aren't just my thoughts. It's supported by these other sources that I'm going to refer to periodically. But the majority of the paper should be yours. The sources are not the main focus of your paper. Your ideas are, your argument, your claim. That's the focus. You should have your own ideas about your topic. You should have your own thought process about your topic. Your own main points that you yourself have thought out. And you're just using the sources to help show the reader that your thoughts are valid and supported by other professionals. So, Take ownership of that. Be honest, accurate, and measured with how you use your sources. Show respect to your reader, show respect to the topic, and show respect to opposing points of view. And establish your own credibility by showing that you've done careful research and that you're showing respect to the sources you've used for that research. So, using sources is very, it's, it's easy and yet complicated at the same time. <laughs> it's easy to, you know, to read articles and use information from them. It's not so easy to do it responsibly and effectively. So, if you're writing with poor use of sources, where you're really not doing it the right way, a poor paper might read just like 
like you're reciting unconnected facts. You're just throwing stuff in and seeing what sticks, basically. Uh, nothing is explained. Nothing is unpacked. Nothing is connected. There might even be contradictory or illogical, nonsensical conclusions that you make because you didn't go through the source material properly. So you're using two different sources, let's say, and you're not connecting the information, you're not showing the, your, your line of reasoning, and it turns out that those two sources seem to say opposite things. But you're not explaining that or you're using a source to prove a point and you didn't explain how it proves the point, so to the reader, none of it makes sense, right? Um, poor use of sources might be distorting the information from your source or taking it out of context and trying to manipulate it to make it fit your point of view. At its worst, Poor use of sources involves plagiarism, which we're going to hit on really hard in this PowerPoint. If you're writing with a really strong use of sources, the, a strong paper is going to center on your ideas, right? Ideas that are advanced, that are developed um, with thoughtful paragraphs, with exposition and explanation, and good use of sources with proper citations. You are going to offer a logical analysis or maybe an argument that's built on those sources to support what you already think. Um, and you're going to treat them with respect, those sources. right? So how do you use sources in an essay? The first thing you can do is summary. So let's say you read an article that's like five paragraphs long and you don't necessarily intend on pulling just one little piece of information from those five paragraphs. You're kind of going to discuss the whole idea of those five paragraphs. You can summarize it, right? It's capturing the original author's principal ideas, the main ideas coming from that article. Um, it's typically, you typically use summary in a research paper when you want to just provide a general overview of something and not specific details. But even still, you're not taking anything word for word. You're not putting a specific section into your own words. You're summarizing the whole thing you still provide a citation. You still give credit to that source. You can also paraphrase. This is where you put things in your own words, right? You take what the author said and you restate it in your own words, your own tone, your own voice, right? Typically, we use a paraphrase when we need to provide a specific detail to support your, your own idea. So in this case, that five paragraph article that we were looking at, we didn't summarize it. Instead, there was one little section that really helped explain a very specific detail in our own argument. So we're going to take that section and that section only and then restate it in our own words, our own voice, right? Um, and it'll often end up being roughly the same length as the original. So if the original was three sentences, your paraphrase will probably also be around three sentences. And again, you have to cite it. You, you got that information, you got those ideas from a source, you provide a parenthetical citation for it. The third way that you can use source material is quoting. This is where you take the exact words that the original author used. We typically want to use direct quotes, 
very sparingly. Paraphrase should be what is used most often. You only want to use direct quotes when you feel like the author's words cannot be replaced or restated, or when it's um, when it might also it might be even more confusing to the reader if you tried to put it in your own words. <laughs> All right, so sometimes it's best to just take the author's words as they are verbatim. That is when you're going to use quotation marks, right, from the first word to the last word. It can be just, it can be two sentences, word for word. It could be one sentence. It could be a phrase from a sentence. It could be just one word that you've taken from that section. Always in parentheses, though, if it is exact wording, even if it's one word. You still give the citation for it, even if you put the quotation marks around it. You still have to provide the parenthetical citation. Also, if you're using a direct quote that gets particularly long, like 40 words or more, you have to format it in a special way called um, block quotation, which you can find in handbooks or on APA.org. Uh, but again, because quotes are supposed to be used so sparingly, you also want to sparingly use really long ones. <laughs> but occasionally, you know, it does call for a longer quote, and if it's 40 words or more, you'll block it. But you still have to provide the parenthetical citation every time you use information from a source, no matter how you incorporate it into the essay. Whether it's summary, paraphrase, or direct quote, always cite it. Always. So, I keep referring to citing your sources or else it's going to be plagiarism. Let's look more closely at what plagiarism actually is. It is when you use someone else's words, someone else's ideas or someone else's images like pictures, graphs, charts and you make it appear as though they were that they're your own. You don't let the reader know that those words came from this person or these ideas came from that person or this chart came from that source you just include it in the essay and pretend like it's your own. Or maybe you're not even trying to pretend like it's your own, but you didn't tell us that it came from somewhere else or someone else, so it appears as though it's yours. That's plagiarism. When you use source material, whether it's published in print or online, without acknowledging the source, that is plagiarism. And it can happen in a variety of ways. One way is by submitting a paper that you didn't write. So whether that's using a paper that a friend of yours wrote for another class, asking your roommate or your significant other or a friend of yours to write your paper for you, or going online and paying money for an essay that has already been written, or paying money to a website that will, you know, you give them the topic and someone writes the essay for you. All of that is plagiarism. If you're pasting large chunks of a source into your paper and trying to pass it off as your own, I've had, I've seen this happen, you know. Um, will say that the, you know a good portion of the paper was the student's own words and ideas, but then all of a sudden there's like these two paragraphs that were clearly not written by the student. <laughs> and I'll look into it and sure enough, they copied and pasted two whole paragraphs and just plopped it into their own paper. Using the summaries, paraphrases, and direct quotes without proper
for citation. That is plagiarism. Using the, okay, using a direct quote, taking something word for word from the source without putting it in the quotation marks, even if you did provide the parenthetical citation, if you did not let your reader know that those word for word came from the source, that's plagiarism. Mixing up source material and your own ideas, failing to distinguish between two, that's plagiarism. What does it look like? It looks like using copy and paste a lot. It looks like failing to cite a source. It looks like neglecting quotation marks where necessary. Confusing the information you got from your source with your own ideas. Or submitting another writer's paper. That's what it looks like. Now, why is it serious? Well, for a lot of reasons. The first is academic dishonesty. At its heart, plagiarism is cheating. It is the exact same thing as sitting next to someone in class and copying their answers on a test. Cheating. Or getting a copy of the answers beforehand and memorizing them and then taking the test. It's cheating using your phone to text questions and answers back and forth to your classmates. Cheating. So is plagiarism. It is cheating. Whether it is intentional plagiarism, like I'm going to buy a website or buy a paper off a website, or I just got confused and forgot to cite this source, it is likely to result in a failing grade for that assignment. Some instructors will give you the opportunity to fix it in some way. Other instructors won't. You'll just receive the zero and that's it. You could end up failing the course for it. If you are plagiarizing on an assignment that, let's say for instance, is, is a required component or is worth a huge percentage of your grade and you plagiarized on it, received a zero, and the instructor will not let you make it up, you're going to fail the course. Some instructors might even have it in their policies in the syllabus that if you get caught plagiarizing, you fail, period. No matter what your percentage might be in the class. It could be noted on your academic transcript, right? Typically when I find out that a student has plagiarized in my class, I make a note of it in the student's notes section in the school's communication system, and I let their dean know. It could also result in you getting kicked out of school, especially if you do it multiple times. Another reason why it's so serious, besides just what it, the effects could be for yourself, it is theft from the academic community. Um, you know, you're taking someone else's work. You're taking someone else's ideas, someone else's words, and, and you're just completely undoing that dialogue that happens in academic communities, right? Um, it also gives you an unfair advantage over your classmates who might be doing the research properly. Uh, you're disrespecting other writers, other researchers, other scholars. You're disrespecting your readers by trying to pass off other people's ideas and words as your own. It's an, it's, it's an insult to your instructor, to your classmates. Um, it's an insult to your school risk, you know, damaging their reputation, possibly. Um, and then it also, you know, you're kind of shortchanging yourself. Uh, you know, you're not 
doing the work yourself. You're not learning anything. It's robbing you of your own credibility and integrity. Um, and you're missing out on learning those skills, those research skills, the thinking and analysis and the writing skills that you're supposed to be learning and that you might need down the road. It's never worth it. <laughs> Just never worth it. So what can you do to make sure that you don't get caught up in the plagiarism machine? The first is resist temptation. I know that there are classes out there that you have had to take, classes you're currently having to take, <laughs> that you'll have to take in the future, and, and you don't really want to be taking that class. You don't, you're not interested in it. Uh, you don't want to put that much effort into it, but resist the temptation. Don't just get things off the internet and try to pass it off as your own. Um, sometimes we get tempted to plagiarize, not because we're not interested or we don't want to do the work, but maybe we ran out of time. <laughs> you know, we waited until the last minute and now we just have to try to turn something in. And that's another reason why students will fall victim to the plagiarism monster. So, setting time aside beforehand to work on things, managing your time, can also help you resist the temptation. Simply playing by the rules, knowing that anytime you use source material, you have to give credit to it, knowing that you need to do the research on your own, that it needs to be mostly your ideas you need to have. You need to be able to write the paper from start to finish completely on your own. Then add the source material in to help back up what you have already said. That's what I always tell students. The goal is that you should have enough to say about your topic that you could just write it from start to finish with no sources. But sources are probably required, so then you find sources that will help back up what you say. Or maybe you need to look for sources that actually present an opposing point of view, you know, that goes against what you say. So, but having your own thoughts about the topic will help you resist the temptation to plagiarize. Take very orderly, accurate notes when you're going through potential sources. Keep track of what sources you're looking at what information you found in each specific source. If you're able to print things, highlight or underline the sections that you anticipate including in your essay. That way you don't forget what information came from a source and you don't forget which source it came from, right? Document all of that borrowed material in some way, right? and work carefully with it in the paper. Use it effectively. Use it with thought and with purpose. Yes, you're required to use, let's say, three to five sources. Don't just randomly pop in source material. Make a conscious decision. Make, it, make sure there's a reason why you're using it this particular source information in this particular part of your essay. If you are doing it with purpose, chances are better that you are going to have a better system of what your sources are and what information came from each one. And the biggest one is resist the temptation. So the last few slides have some scenarios here, you know, and we're asking the question, is it plagiarism? I want to go through a few of these just to give you guys a better idea of, of how um, systemic plagiarism could be. Meaning it's not always super obvious in your face, I copied and pasted the entire essay from the internet. Sometimes it's more subtle, <laughs> right? 
So you write a paper about the legalization of marijuana for like one of your very first classes. And then you save that paper, right? And then you take another class, a few semesters down the road, a few terms down the road, and you decide that you would be able to use it for another class. So you made some changes to it and turned it in. Is that plagiarism? It could be. The, the expectation is that you are doing original work for every class you take. Having said that, there are a lot of instructors who actually are fine letting you use a paper that you wrote for them for another class. But you also have to make sure that your current instructor is also okay with it. Your professor discusses some interesting ideas in today's lecture. You decide that you're going to use some of those lecture notes in your paper. Would that be plagiarism? Is that academically dishonest? Probably not, but it still is probably necessary to cite the notes. You need to still acknowledge that the ideas were not your own. Um, so take good notes. Make sure you have the date recorded, cite the lecture, right? Um, and then check with your professor, check with your instructor, and they might even be able to help you with uh, where they got the information, right? All right. So, on slide 10. In a paper on the history of hate speech in America, you find this passage in a fall 2001 article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy by Jennifer E. Rockman. The law surrounding threats has gained recent attention from commentators after decades of virtual anonymity uh, and unaddressed confusion among the lower courts. The sudden interest in threats has been sparked primarily by the proliferation of widely disseminated internet speech. And then the citation there, Rothman 286. That's actually in MLA format, not APA, sorry. You decide to use this quote as is. Could it be considered academically dishonest? Probably not, but it could be, depending on how the passage is used. Because this particular passage uses some words, has some vocabulary in it, that we probably don't use on a daily basis unless we are in some sort of law or criminal justice program. So you need to make sure you understand those words like virtual anonymity, proliferation, dissemination. You need to make sure you understand the words and what she actually means in that passage. If you're using it, if, if you understand all of that, you're using it in the correct context, it's not academic dishonesty. You cited it, you quoted it, you're good to go. It could be trouble, though, if you're trying to use this passage, but you didn't really bother to look up those words or figure out what it really means. Then you might use it in your essay and it just be completely contradictory, um, and you might end up saying something you don't want to say. It's plagiarism because you're using someone else's ideas without even understanding them. And that's the same as copying, because you're not thinking about it. You're not putting your own work into it. So on slide 11, we have the same passage that we're dealing with. And we decided instead of using the direct quote, we're going to paraphrase it. We're going to put it in our own words. So again, the original says, the law surrounding threats has gained recent attention from commentators after decades of virtual anonymity and unaddressed confusion among the lower courts. The sudden interest in threats has been sparked primarily by the proliferation of widely disseminated internet speech. Rothman, 286. Here's your paraphrase. Remember, 
taking the gist of what she had said in that passage and, and putting it in your own words, with your own tone and your own voice, with your own vocabulary. The law surrounding threats has gained notoriety lately after many years of virtual anonymity and unsolved confusion among the lower courts. The sudden interest in threats has been raised mostly by the increase in internet use to spread messages. Is that plagiarism? I mean, we still gave the parenthetical citation, Rothman, right? Yes, it is plagiarism, even though you gave the parenthetical citation. It's because you've still plagiarized the whole sentence structure. It's almost like you just took a thesaurus <laughs> and said, okay, I'm just going to replace every other word with a synonym for that word. Or like you put it through a translator, a translator app. That's not what paraphrase is. It's not how it works. This is still way too close to the original. If this is how you're trying to paraphrase something, it would be in your best interest to simply use the direct quote. We will learn later though tricks for doing paraphrasing. But just keep in mind, simply changing some words is not paraphrasing. Using a thesaurus to change every other word to a synonym is not paraphrasing. And even though you gave the citation for it, you are still, it, when you paraphrase something, you're indicating that you put forth the effort to think about what the original author said and to put it into terms that are more familiar and comfortable to yourself and to your reader so that it flows and fits more naturally with the rest of your paper. So if you do it like this, you have not put in that work. You're still trying to take what they said and pass it off as your own. Just use the direct quote. So on slide 12, we have an original passage here. How many of the world's top 100 sexiest women have tattoos? FMH Magazine published their annual list of the 100 sexiest women in the world 2002 as voted on by their readers. The poll offers a fascinating insight into the popularity of tattoos among female celebrities. A quick look at the top 100 list reveals that one of the things that many of the women picked have in common is body art, i.e. tattoos. So the student wanted to use information from that passage in their essay, and this is what they came up with. Many of the world's top 100 sexiest women have tattoos. Two years ago, FMH Magazine published their annual list of the 100 sexiest women in the world as voted on by their readers. The poll offers a fascinating insight into the popularity of tattoos among female celebrities. A quick look at the top 100 list reveals that one of the common, one of the things that many women picked have in common is body art, i.e. tattoos. So, did they plagiarize? We'll assume they gave the citation. I didn't put it there, but... Let's look, though, just at the paraphrase. On the right-hand side, under answer, it says what the student's paper looks like if the original source's words are in italics and the, this student's original words are in bold. And look at that. There's three words in bold. That's it. Everything else is in italics which means everything else is still exactly as it appeared in the original. So removing the words how and adding two years ago does not equate paraphrasing. It is still blatantly word for word the original source, but it's not in quotation marks, so it's plagiarism. All right. We have another example here on slide 13. Here's the original passage. Clearly, tattooing has emerged from the underbelly to the surface of the American landscape, and as the popularity of tattoos has expanded, so has the art itself. No longer restricted to Betty Page lookalikes, muddy blue anchors, and ribbon-wrapped hearts reading Mom, 
Today's tattoo images make bold statements of personality, as individualized and varied as any art form. Here's what the student did in their paper. It's a fact that tattoos have arisen from the underbelly to the top of the American landscape. Tattooing has experienced a growing popularity, and so has the art itself. It is no longer limited to sailor-style ships and blue anchors or biker-type hearts reading mom. Today's images include bold statements of individualized personality as diverse as any art form. And then a citation. So again, on the right-hand side, under the answer column, we can see if we take everything that appeared in the original passage and put it in italics and then take the student's wording and put it in bold, it's not quite as bad as the previous slide, but still look, very little of it is, is in the author, the student's words. There's still lots of it that are taken word for word from the original. So not only does the student's version copy the majority of the original's actual wording, it completely followed the order of the ideas, which by itself constitutes plagiarism. You're just, you're still not interacting with it. You're not engaging with it, and you're not putting in the work to make it fit with your own writing. That makes sense. So be very careful how you use your source information. You'll use summaries if you're dealing with a longer work and you just want to kind of capture the original author's main ideas. Still have to cite it. Paraphrasing is when you're taking these smaller passages and the idea is to put it in your own words, to truly think about what the original says and then not look at the original <laughs> and say it in your own words. That's what you want to put in your paper when you're paraphrasing. Still give the citation, right? But just changing a few things around isn't paraphrasing. It's still too close to direct quoting, but you're not putting the quotation marks around it, so now it's plagiarism. But you don't want to use direct quotes too much. Remember, we said we only wanted to use them when we honestly feel like the author's original words can't, shouldn't be changed. So you know you want to use quotes sparingly, but at the same time, you have to be able to truly paraphrase, because if you don't paraphrase good enough and you leave the quotation marks out, that's plagiarism. So you have to find the balance. Use the direct quotes sparingly, but learn how to truly paraphrase. And again, we're going to actually look at a process that you can use. I want to end the PowerPoint, though, by talking about some other types of source abuses that don't necessarily fall under plagiarism, but they are mistakes that often get made with source material. And you want to try to avoid these as well. And just to be a critical thinker, you also want to notice where you see these show up in everyday life. The media, social media, radio, classrooms, right? Using sources inaccurately. <laughs> this literally means like you, you, you're, you're taking something that means one thing and trying to pass it off as if it means something else. Or you didn't bother to look up what it actually meant and you just used it in your own paper. Using sources inaccurately, don't do it. Using source material out of context. If, if you're reading a source that's making a statement, and the author makes a statement about a particular event, don't try to take that statement and apply it to something larger, because you're taking it out of context. Or don't try, try to take that statement and apply it to a totally different event that's taking it out of context. 
do not overuse source material. Remember, the majority of your paper should be your own ideas, your own line of reasoning. If you have every three sentences coming from a source, all you've done is just regurgitate information. It's not yours. None of it is yours. So do not overuse source material. Be very purposeful and critical about where you include source information in the essay. Don't just plunk quotations down. Even if you cite it correctly, and it's in quotation mark, you have to connect it, you have to explain it, right? You have to incorporate the source material into the paragraph you're putting it in, right? You don't just make a statement with a sentence and then plop a quotation down and move on. You have to incorporate that quotation into your sentence structure, and then you have to explain the quote, connect it to the point of that paragraph. Don't just plop them in. Don't use blanket citations. <laughs> um, you be very specific and accurate with every citation you use. Do not rely heavily on just one source. If I see on your reference list that you have five sources listed and one of them gets cited, I see it in the essay numerous times, and the other four sources each only get mentioned once, you're overusing, you're relying too much on that one source. You want to have enough variety within your sources that you can use them all mostly equally, right? Of course, failing to match your in-text citation to the reference list entry. Now, you've cited it. You have a parenthetical citation. You're trying to give credit to the original author. So it's not full-on plagiarism. But the problem is that what you have in the parentheses does not match up with how you did the entry on the reference page, right? So don't mess up your sources in that way either. And then some academic offenses that relate to plagiarism. Double dipping, we already talked about that one. That's where you take a paper you've written for another class and try to use it in a different class. Uh, be respectful and ask if it's okay. False staffing is where you turn in another student's work, and possibly with their permission. <laughs> um, don't false staff. Do your own work. And copyright violations. Keep in mind that anything that is not yours, you need to give credit to it. So even like images, song lyrics, things like that, you have to give credit. And you have to make sure that how you're using it and, and showing it to others is legal. Okay? So that is the gist of plagiarism. Um, the middle part of this PowerPoint on summarizing, paraphrasing, and quoting how to use those sources We'll, we'll talk about those more in depth. We will learn some tricks on how to paraphrase and make sure that it's a true paraphrase. <laughs> We're gonna talk about that in more depth. From this PowerPoint, just be thinking about all the different ways that plagiarism happens, all the different reasons why plagiarism happens, why it is so important to make sure that you don't commit plagiarism and different things that you can do to help make sure you don't commit plagiarism. Okay. If you have any questions, um, let me know.